There's a lot more to food than what meets the fork. But sometimes you have to take things with a grain of salt. Tonight, we'll get the dish on a few famous food phrases. Could a baker's dozen save a baker's life? Ooh, are cucumbers really cool, or is that a lot of hot air? Can you really butter someone up with butter? Are they old wives' tales, ancient elixirs, or just clever marketing ploys? Every bite you take has a story, every morsel a myth. Is it baked with fact or flavored with fiction? Cooking is an art, but baking, that's a science. Bakers have always had a personal stake in keeping things precise, except when it comes to the dozen. In every other aspect of life, a dozen means 12. Why does a baker's dozen total 13? You're at a bakery, and you place your order. An even dozen donuts, bagels, muffins, what have you. Odds are, you get an extra one thrown in for free. But why? Well, it all goes back to ancient times. Bread was a primary staple in early civilizations like Egypt and Babylon, so naturally, bakers took their baking very seriously. I'm bread serious! But before the days of electronic scales and standard measures, it was easy for bakers to skimp on goods, leaving customers with less bread for their bread. And while it was a piece of cake to cheat a customer, getting caught could result in a dire penalty. Food historian and baker Rose Lawrence explained. It's always been a problem in baking in ancient times and modern times where loaves can be a little underweight or you'd cut that wheat with like a lesser grain to fill it in. So there was definitely kind of some shady things going around with bakers. So in ancient Egypt and Babylon, it was definitely a situation where bakers had to be really careful because there weren't a lot of scales back then that were really accurate. And if a baker was caught giving a light loaf, they could face so much punishment, including having having a hand chopped off, which obviously would make baking very difficult. These strict and brutal laws stayed on the books for centuries, and eventually were codified in Britain with a law called the Assize of Bread and Ale. So the Assize of Bread and Ale was a British law passed in 1266 under Henry II, and this was the first law that we saw really attempt to regulate a product from its very beginning in its ingredients to the time it hit the customer. The reason for the law on bread and ale um, had to do with the idea that these were the common diet. Everyone needed to eat bread, and therefore everyone deserved to eat bread. And with overwhelming public support and the pressure on the king, this law came into action. So it regulated the price of wheat as it compares to the price of a loaf of bread, and of course incorporated all those crazy, harsh punishments for bakers. Harsh punishments is an understatement. Bakers who violated the assize of bread and ale could lose a hand, an ear, or get a public flogging until they apologized to every single customer. Cheat someone out of bread, and that's a career-ending move. So, naturally, British bakers decided it was better to be safe than handless, and protected themselves and their appendages by throwing in an extra-baked item with every dozen ordered. Sure, it cost them a little profit-wise, but in the end, it was definitely better than baking shorthanded. And sometimes it could even go up to 14 if you really like them. But regardless of what you were buying, bakers were really cautious to be over rather than under. So if you bought two loaves of bread, you were going to get a cookie or a muffin just to make sure you were overly satisfied and they weren't at risk of losing a limb. Here in America, the baker's dozen tradition had a much less violent beginning. Legend has it that in colonial times in Albany, New York, there was a baker um, and an old woman came to visit it around Christmas and ordered 12 cookies. So when he gave her the 12 and she requested a 13th, he refused her outright and she yelled, I curse you! After that, nothing the baker made came out right. So come the next year around Christmas, the old woman paid him a visit again, only to find that now 12 cookies always came with a 13th. She was so pleased by this that she lifted the curse, and as she was leaving the bakery, the baker saw that she was actually St. Nicholas in disguise. St. Nick likes cookies in December and wants to make sure there's always an extra one going around. So, whichever story you buy, the tale of the baker saving his own skin, or the case of the cross-dressing St. Nick, the takeaway is clear. If your donut shop is willing to throw in a freebie, I wouldn't ask a lot of questions.
Almost anything can be sold as a baker's dozen, but most of the time I'm selling like cookies or donuts or bread by the baker's dozen. These are the things that people have very little impulse control with and always want a little extra one. I give them out to returning customers, really enthusiastic people. It's such a great way to spontaneously reward someone who's excited about baked goods. So if someone's going to try something new, that's a great way to slip them an extra treat. You're out with your friends toasting the toastworthy, but before you raise your glass, Find out the sneaky meaning behind the old saying, bottoms up. Next, on Food, Fact, or Fiction. Bottoms up. The time-honored call to raise your glass and toss one down the hatch. But the expression wasn't always just a precursor to some really embarrassing selfies. Legend has it, in the 18th and 19th centuries, the British Navy tried to lure London pub-goers into enlisting by fronting them a shilling. A sneaky recruiter would drop a coin into the pint of an already blitzed reveler, who of course wouldn't notice until after he'd finished the beer. By then it was too late. Payment was considered accepted and the poor sap was shipped out to sea. To nip this practice in the bud, pubs swapped their standard steins for tankards with transparent bottoms. This gave rise to the custom of lifting the bottoms up to check for any unwanted coinage. But drink one too many and you may have to pick your own bottom up off the floor. I know what you're thinking. How'd this guy get to be so chill, so calm, so cool? <laughs> you're coin a cliche, I'm as cool as a cucumber. But what's so cool about cucumbers? Are they all that nonchalant? Or is this literally about temperature? Is cool as a cucumber based on scientific fact? Figuratively speaking, cool as a cucumber means calm, relaxed, and in control. But according to food nerd Dan Kohler, there was a time when this cool catchphrase would have meant something entirely different. The word cool has been around for centuries. I mean, for a long time, it actually just meant a milder form of cold, obviously. And then we find it morphing in the Middle Ages. All of a sudden, we're using that word to describe an amount of things. So you say, I'll need a cool army of soldiers or a cool million. In the 1600s, the word cool took on a completely different meaning, thanks to the world's greatest playwright, William Shakespeare. To be or not to be cool. He uses the word to describe something else entirely, and he's now applying it to feelings and temperament. So in Hamlet, you find Queen Gertrude saying to Hamlet, Oh, gentle son, upon the heat and flame of thy distemper, sprinkle cool patience. She's not telling him to be temperature cool. She's telling him to be even healed. Simmer down there, Hamlet. So, when did the cucumber join the cool cast of characters? The phrase cool as a cucumber actually comes from a British poet named John Gay. And in 1732, he wrote a poem called A New Song of Similes. And in the third verse, you find him saying, Pert as a pearmonger I'd be, if Molly were but kind. Cool as a cucumber could see the rest of womankind. But there's a reason that cool as a cucumber sticks around. That alliteration makes it really fun to say. The very first simile in the poem is, my passion is as mustard strong. But no one says I'm as passionate as mustard. That's not fun to say. Little lads love alliterations. It wasn't until the 20th century, the 40s and 50s to be precise, that cool took on its current meaning. In like 1948, you start seeing the word in printed form, and it's to describe jazz specifically. So you find uh, an article that says, the bebop people have a language all their own. Their expressions of approval include cool. Jazz critics used it to describe Dizzy Gillespie's laid back sound. Oh yeah, that's cool sound. That is cool. Yeah, that like real cool, baby. Cool. And they call him, quote, a trumpeter who is hot, cool, and gone. The description of Dizzy Gillespie is probably as cool as Dizzy Gillespie himself. I would love to be called hot, cool, and gone. And that's really the first time we find the word cool highlighted as a word that's used to say, that thing is awesome. I think when we call somebody cool as a cucumber right now, it means that they're very even-tempered, they're unflappable. But it doesn't mean that they're cool in the modern sense of cool. It just means that they're even keeled. This is all well and good, but it really gets you thinking. Are cucumbers actually cool? This is going to take some science to find out when food, fact, or fiction returns. You can say someone is cool as a cucumber, but how long have people actually been cool with them? Cucumbers have been cultivated for the last 3,000 years, originating in the Himalayan foothills. 
Through trade and migration, cucumbers were brought to Egypt and then made their way to Rome, where one particular person was especially cucumber crazy. Emperor Tiberius had them on the brain. It was said he ate them every day and had special greenhouses built to make sure he had a fresh supply year round. Later, cucumbers became popular all over Europe as well as here in America, where their smooth green coats have fooled health nuts nationwide. Cucumbers, believe it or not, are not vegetables. Even though we eat them in salads, they're actually fruit. So cucumbers belong to a family called Cucurbitaceae. And in that family, you also have zucchini, and squash, pumpkins, and gourds. Somehow, the phrase cool as a Cucurbitaceae doesn't really roll off the tongue. So is this fruit in disguise really cool? Or is this just another cover? So we're going to take the temperature of the room around us and then, using a probe thermometer, find out the exact temperature of the inside of a cucumber. Now you can see, using this thermometer, that it's actually close to 80 degrees in the room right now. Let's see what the cucumber says. As you can see, this cucumber, which has been at room temperature all night, is at 71.4 degrees, which is about 9 degrees cooler than the actual room temperature, as measured by this thermometer. Well, it's just like we thought. The insides of these proto-pickles do measure several degrees cooler than the air. So why is that? So it all comes back to water when we're looking at this temperature difference. Cucumbers are about 95% water, and water has a heat capacity that is four times different than the heat capacity of air. Now, heat capacity is a scientific principle that explains the amount of energy it takes to raise by one degree Celsius the temperature of any given substance. Water, and for all intents and purposes, cucumbers are just water, needs four times as much energy as the air around it to go up just one degree. Experts say reaching for a cucumber after a workout can hydrate you twice as well as a glass of water. In fact, cucumbers have the highest water content of any solid food. Apples weigh in at 84%. Bananas, just 74 And that's why we never say, breezy as a banana. So it turns out that cucumbers, no matter what the air temperature, will always be cooler. So I guess the phrase cool as a cucumber actually holds some scientific weight. Let's see if I'm cool as a cucumber. Definitely not. Cool as a cucumber isn't just a fun alliteration. It's a food phrase that's as good as gold. Aren't you pleased as punch? I don't think I've ever been as cool as a cucumber. I don't think I've ever been cool, but I like the phrase. So the next time my nature turns up the heat, instead of cranking the AC, try snapping into a cucumber. But I'd keep one of these nearby, just in case. Ooh, that's nice. In order to get a great picture, it helps to stay cool. Though not everyone can easily flash the camera a winning smile, we all respond to a friendly, say cheese. But was there once a time we all said prunes? Find out when Food Fact or Fiction returns. Every photographer knows to get a big smile out of someone, all you have to do is make them say cheese. The long E sound forces the corners of your mouth up, whether you're feeling happy or not. It wasn't always this way. Before the cheese came the prune. In the late 1800s, the Victorian era, people posing for a pic were urged to say prunes. The word prunes pinched people's mouths closed into that serious expression you see in old photos. Families wanted their one picture to be proper and formal. If you wanted a smile, you had to make like Tyra and do it with your eyes. Also, dentistry wasn't up to snuff, so many people were well advised to avoid a toothy grin. Boo! No cheese for this guy. Oh, yeah. Pretty much anything is better with butter. Mmm. That's what I call comfort food. <laughs> so isn't it odd that the phrase, butter someone up, has a negative spin? Today, it's a common way to describe insincere flattery used in order to get something from another person. But this phrase wasn't always so accusatory. Did buttering someone up begin with Buddha? We melted on our pancakes, our veggies, and our steaks. But how did this magical ingredient end up in a phrase about flattery? It probably has something to do with wives trying to get their husbands to do something. Um, maybe movie theaters because of the buttered popcorn? I suppose spreading creamy butter on a slice of bread is an apt metaphor for laying it on thick. But perhaps the origin of this saying isn't quite so obvious. 
Food historian Tori Avey is about to do a little Tibetan time traveling. The art of butter sculpting dates back 400 years to a Tibetan tradition where gifts were offered to Buddha from domesticated animals. And these butter sculptures, which were known as tormas, were actually made from yak's milk. Yakety yak! Don't talk back. Buddhist monks would sculpt the butter into beautiful, colorful, really exquisite uh, religious offerings. The elaborate tormas depicting gods and heroes, flora and fauna, required great skill and care to create. Since butter and body heat don't mix, monks had to work in cold rooms, constantly dipping their hands in icy water to ensure their sculptures wouldn't melt in the process. So if these buttery builds were literally used to butter up Buddha, then where did the phrase come from? The British first made contact with Tibet in the 1800s, and it's thought that this phrase, butter someone up, actually has roots there, that it developed out of the British first encountering the Tibetan sculpting butter. Ooh! So buttery! But the vast British Empire had a strong presence in India, where another buttery ritual had taken root. There's an ancient Indian custom where people would throw butterballs at statues of the gods to seek favor. Since Tibet and India were under British rule, it's safe to say they both had an influence on the evolution of the phrase. And in the 1800s, butter me up made its way to America, where women took the saying and the art to a whole new level. In the mid to late 1800s, churning butter was actually considered woman's work. And for many of these women, sculpting that butter was kind of a natural outgrowth of that process. It was a creative outlet. From New York to California, women would compete in butter sculpting competitions where they'd make elaborate butter sculptures, some weighed up to 600 pounds. During the Great Depression and World War II, however, the art of butter sculpting took a hit. So during the war, many food items were rationed, including butter, and uh, many households had to rely on margarine as a substitute for butter, but margarine is very soft and you can't really sculpt it, so butter sculpting kind of fell out of favor. Today, butter sculptures are enjoying a renaissance at state fairs all across America, where the origins of the phrase, butter me up, have long been forgotten. But don't cry for Buddha. He still gets his due. Monks do still butter up Tormas every year as part of the Butter Lantern Festival, which takes place every January 15th, and it's the climax of the Tibetan New Year. Who do I have to butter up to get tickets to that? So, the next time someone tries to butter you up, don't be offended. Just say, thanks for the Torma. That'll confuse them. Today, we saw how food shapes our language. We learned that a baker's dozen kept many a baker from going to pieces, that cucumbers keep cool even when the heat is on, and that a buttery metaphor began as a tribute to the Buddha. Don't you feel enlightened? No meal is complete without a spoonful of fact and a dash of fiction.